Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Simon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as the introduction stated, we've been working across a number of different policy areas, but actually it's been a real pleasure and a real privilege to work with, I think, 11 or 12 forces over the last five or six years. And so now I can report some of the successes as well as some of the things that didn't work as well. So um, this is what we're going to cover. Um, first of all, I'll kick off with an introduction to behavioral insights. What's it all about? Why does it matter? And then we're going to go straight into some case studies. Um, some of the more classic things I'm going to present and some of the more new things, which if any of you are familiar with some of our work, um, you definitely won't have heard those. So Evie's going to present those. Um, and then finally, we can open it up to discussion. OK? So um, what do we mean by behavioral insights? Well, we traditionally have three levers of public policy. We have regulation, law and enforcement, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So we can compel people to do stuff. We can incentivize or disincentivize people to do stuff, like tax. Um, and we can advertise stuff. We can make people aware of things. We can try and influence attitudes. Behavioral insights shouldn't really be an exception to any of those approaches, but actually it's a means of informing those approaches and, and trying to make them as, a, as effective as possible. So at its heart, behavioral insights is about psychology, ethnography, trying to observe people in their own environments, trying to understand why they do stuff and when they do stuff, behavioral economics and public policy. But really, what do those terms mean? From my perspective, it's about understanding how people behave in practice rather than in theory. So there are two parts to what we do. We try and identify what the literature tells us, what the psychology and behavioral economics literature tells us, that people, how people should respond to different scenarios. But more importantly, we then observe them empirically, and we test how adaptations to those scenarios will influence their behavior. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Um, I could go on talking a little bit more, or we could just play a game to demonstrate it. Which would you prefer? I think you said game. OK. Can you have some means of writing, like a phone or just a pen, ready? I'm going to ask you to look at the screen and try and remember what you say. Sorry, what you see. But don't write anything yet. That's the important thing. Pens down. Not even in your hand. Ready? OK. Can you write down as many um, items as you can remember? You've got about 30 seconds. Ten seconds. OK. Can you put your hand up if you got at least five? Keep your hand up if you got six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, really. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Um, better than the Home Office. Not quite as good as the Treasury. Um, I've done this experiment a lot. So now's the interesting bit. Can you put your hands up if you got Apple? And can you look around to see roughly how many people you think got Apple? Now keep your hands up for helicopter and do the same. Can you see how many people got helicopter? I'm going to ask you for the pattern. All right. Policeman. <laughs> Music. Is working very well, so I hope you notice what's going on. Dog. Who got dog? OK, look around. 
and who got golf? Does anyone know what the pattern is between the two? Yeah. Apple, policeman, and dog are either at the beginning or at the end. Helicopter, music, and golf are in the middle. And what happens is that as whenever I do this, around twice as many people get apple, policeman, and dog as who get the other column. And the reason being is simply we tend to remember information which is at the beginning of a communication or at the end. That seems simple enough, right? But when we're communicating with the public or in any interface that agents of the state have with the public, we often forget that quite simple doctrine. So when we apply that to even you know, quite simple means of communication like tax reminders, telling people, by the way, you haven't you know, completed your self-assessment tax debt, but you say what you have to do up front rather than burying it somewhere in the text, it leads to um, increased tax compliance and, and uh, uh, more efficient means of collecting tax. So, that's one example. I'm going to give you a few other examples before we go into the police case studies. Um, thinking about those three levers of behavior, law enforcement, information, um, and incentives, here we have two identical scenarios. It's in Amsterdam. Um, there's about 85 bicycles that have been chained up by a wall. They've all been flyered. No one really wants a flyer in their bicycle. The temptation is to discard it, to litter it. But we know that littering is bad, right? There's nothing to prevent the people littering there. There's no means of enforcement. Um, we also know that graffiti is not allowed because there's information there which says graffiti is not allowed. Yet in one of the scenarios, someone has violated that rule and has graffitied. Experimenters wanted to test whether or not there would be a difference in littering so breaking a social norm effectively, if a different social norm had been violated. And what they found was that people were more than twice as likely to, um, to litter in the scenario where there was graffiti. This may not seem surprising. This, this experiment was actually reiterated six times, so the experimenters are reasonably confident in the results. The point here is that we need to think slightly differently about behavior. So about 40 years ago, um, a professor called Daniel Kahneman began thinking about why people um, behave the way they do. And he said that there were actually two systems of thought within the brain. Um, one is our um, intuitive and quick way of thinking. It processes information very rapidly, and that allows us to live at a sensible speed. So if I say, what's two times two, you think instantly four. Um, but the other, actually, is our more reflective way. It's what I refer to as active thinking. So it's effortful. If I say, what's 17 times 24, most people, maybe the person who claimed to have got 13, might begin to work them out. But most people won't bother. The point, of Kahneman, um, the point that Kahneman made was that actually, most of the time, 80% of the time, it's our system one that's influencing our actions. So the question is, how do we therefore influence system one? And it is things like, this is um, not the slide I was expecting. Um, it's things like, the environment in which decisions are made, things like graffiti and various other things, that are more consequential um, than we previously thought. So for policymakers and for people who work in public services, there's an opportunity there. The opportunity is to scrutinize seemingly insignificant details in the way information is presented, in the way various other transactions with um, offenders, members of the public are conducted that actually might influence behavior in one way or another. And what we found in a number of different policy areas is that by focusing on these details and making small manipulations to them, you can actually encourage behavior very successfully without having to um, invest a great deal in creating new processes or new policies. So um, what I just showed you was an experiment um, uh, which was re reasonably circumstantial. So people weren't asked to actively engage. But here's an experiment from um, the University of Western Sydney where 500 um, jurors were asked to consider a court case and they were actively told to really think about the details of the case. Um, it was a mock terrorist trial and everything was, um, sorry, there are three variants of this, and they were identical. The same actors, the same scripts, everything was the same. The only difference was that in one condition, um, the defendant was presented in a glass cage, in another, in an open dock, and um, finally, um, 
at the bar, US style. They, the experimenters then measured the difference in guilty verdicts and found that they were quite substantially different. Now, obviously, these are under experimental conditions, but it still it gives you an indication that actually, um, you know, even when people are asked to actively think about something, um, environmental um, details can be consequential. So that's experimental data. This is um, real data, uh, so to speak. And for, forgive me for um, the morbid tone, but this is um, data which demonstrates suicides in Britain between um, the early 60s and, and, and the mid 70s. As you can see, it's a 30% decline. Does anyone know what's driving this decline? In, in all other comparable economies, um, suicide rate um, did not do that. It does. In the beginning part of that graph, 50% of suicides were committed um, by breathing in carbon monoxide, so usually in the home. And synthetic gas creates carbon monoxide when it's burnt. However, over the course of that period of time, we discovered natural gas in the North Sea, and eventually all houses were served with natural gas, which does not create carbon monoxide when it's burnt. So you see that 50% of people reduces to 0% of people because they're not able to do that anymore. And the critical point is there is some displacement because overall suicide reduces by 30%, not 50%, but it's not total. So even that, the most consequential of decisions can be affected by the means in which, or the, the choices, the way they're presented to someone. So, um, <laughs> seems funny to move from suicide to this, but um, in 2010, the uh, former Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister were very taken by um, the behavioral approach and included this phrase in, in the coalition agreement, which allowed for the Behavioral Insights team to be born. It was a small team originally of seven people, which came under a lot of uh, scrutiny from journalists and um, a lot of negative attention in the press. But uh, more recently, it's been um, seen as a success. And the reason for that is um, kind of the second part of, of what we do, which I'm not going to dwell on, but we can touch on it in the questions. But I think it's really important, and that is evaluation. Um, so, particularly if you're, if you're trying to evaluate the impact of what are quite insignificant or seemingly insignificant changes to the way a public service is designed, you need to have very good evaluation to really understand what's happening. Context is everything. So, the way we try and work is identify um, good data sources, and the police are full of good data sources, um, and um, design interventions that allow us to, well, roll out interventions in a way that allow us to um, test what would have happened had the intervention not been rolled out. So that's the important bit. Most people, I think, will be familiar with randomized control trials, so we won't go into it, but we can discuss how some of the interventions have been designed um, at the end, if you shall, if you're interested. So um, uh, Cabinet Office Behavioral Insights Team became the Behavioral Insights Team um, in 2014 becoming a semi-independent, actually an independent organization that's partly owned by the Cabinet Office, allowing us to do work with um, police forces and more organizations outside of central government. Um, these slides are just to show you the spread of behavioral science. So this is where we were working in 2010. This is where we're working now. And um, this is the slide I wanted to show you. Um, Actually, behavioral science has, has spread throughout the world. So many countries, organizations have developed their own units, which is um, fascinating. And, uh, and so long as it's done for good, um, generally a positive thing. So um, some examples of some work we've done with the police. Um, I'm going to present three, and then my colleague Evie will present three, and then we can discuss anything that we've seen or, or maybe something else. Um, this was a, an interesting piece of work that we did with the West Midlands. Now, I don't know if anyone has been caught speeding before. Um, I have. And when I received the, um, the notice of intended prosecution, I genuinely had to read it two or three times to understand what it was asking me to do. Because the title, Notice of Intended Prosecution, 
I mean, it, it, once you understand what it's asking you to do, of course it's obvious, but, but initially you're quite surprised, you may be busy doing other things, and you open this thing, and, and it's not quite clear. So um, this is what um, a notice of intended prosecution looks like. And in order to try and reduce the cognitive burden on people, people are busy, um, and no one really wants to read that they've been caught speeding, um, we worked with Westmids to redesign that notice of intended prosecution to look something like this, which we think is more understandable. So just get straight to the point. What you really want to know is, were you the driver of this vehicle? If you were, fill in this side. If you weren't, fill in the other side. We test that um, by uh, sending it to half of all people who were caught speeding over a six-month period, which is about 7,500 people, and the other half got the original. And then we record the different outcomes. Um, so what we find is that people are more likely to pay and much li less likely to be eligible to be prosecuted. The reduction in prosecution or eligible eligibility for prosecution is higher because there's also an increase in people who um, agree to take up the speed awareness course. Um, and we estimate that saves a decent portion of money, not just for the West Mids, but also for the wider criminal justice system in 12 months. But more importantly, when I was reading this, this notice, I, I thought, why isn't it explaining to me why I shouldn't speed? Because actually, you know, if you're driving along the road and it's 30 miles an hour and there's no one there and maybe it's quite late at night, you think, well, I'm in control of this vehicle. <laughs> I'm more, you know, the legitimacy for my speed is, is more with mine than the person who came up with possibly arbitrary figure. But it's not arbitrary, and we need to explain to people why that is. So rather than this warning which accompanied the, um, the notice of intended prosecution, which um, I don't know if you can read all, all of it, but it, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not particularly great to read if you're receiving it, we changed it to say this. No driver means to kill. They were just going too fast. And, and in it, we explain you know, some of the consequences of speeding and also allude to the fact that a lot of thought goes into setting speed limits. We then measure whether or not people who received this were more or less likely to speed within the next six months. And we find um, a 21% reduction in speeding offenses within six months. Um, so we're very happy with that, and that is uh, being trialled in Manchester and London and Sussex now, too. Um, police recruitment. Recruitment is an interesting um, area where there's lots of potential for behavioural interventions, partly because it's data rich, and we've done a lot of recruitment work with other organisations, including the Army. This was a particularly interesting trial where um, what we found, working with Avon and Somerset, was that Although the proportion of minority candidates um, who started the application process is what you might expect in the area, at a certain point in the process, that halved. So why were um, candidates from ethnic minorities disproportionately failing um, the situational judgment test? Um, looking into the uh, wider literature on um, on this type of thing, we encountered something called stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is the hypothesis that if you feel that there is a stereotype associated with the domain that you're working in or trying to work in, and you don't fit with that stereotype, it may be possible that essentially you don't perform as well because you're trying to perform like that stereotype. So let's assume that you're um, a black male trying to um, get into the police and you think that actually the stereotype is for white males, you might think, subconsciously or otherwise, how would a white person answer this question? And that creates additional cognitive burden. This is a sort of um, nascent area of research, but there's a few trials to suggest that there might be something going on like this. So what can we do about it? Well, um, again, in the wider um, research, there's something called values affirmation, and we can go into more detail, but I don't want to stop here because there's a few more things to get through. Values affirmation is essentially the idea that you ask someone about their values because you're, you're asking who they are, and you're trying to tease out what makes them an individual. And that reminds them of their own qualities. So we do that by this. This is the way the process worked. You 
um, go through a couple of stages, and when you get to the point of the situational judgment test, you receive an email. And the email says, candidate number blah, click here to take this test by Friday. Good luck, something like that. That was the control. So the treatment, we try dear first name. Um, well done for getting this far on the test. You need to take, uh, in the process, you need to take this test by Friday. Before you take this test, um, I'd like you to take some time to think about why you want to be a police constable. For example, what is it about being a police constable that means the most to you and your community? Now, that gets sent to both um, ethnic minority groups and white groups. The sample's too small to do further subgroup analysis, unfortunately. We then test what the outcomes are. And what we find is that in the control um, for white candidates um, versus non-white candidates, we see again the drop-off that we saw previously. So the control is the people who received the normal email, the business as usual email. But for people who received the new email, we see absolutely no difference, that's not statistically significant, in um, white candidates. But it pretty much eliminates the disparity for non-white candidates. Now, as I say, the sample's too small to do detailed subgroup analysis, but um, around 80% of that group, I think, were of um, Afro-Caribbean origin, and the rest, I think, were Eastern European, broadly. There were some um, uh, other small, smaller groups. Finally, um, this one's not an intervention. It's just an interesting piece of analysis that, again, describes how small details can really have an impact. Working with three police forces in Wales, we were asked the question of why um, there seemed to be over-demand on 101 services compared to parts of England. Um, so there was some anecdotal evidence which suggested that people were calling 101 for reasons that um, weren't necessarily um, right for 101. So, for example, neighbor's dog keeps going in my garden, it's really annoying. Um, but that's not coded in the data, so it's very difficult for us to understand that or for us to observe that in, in sort of large data sets. So what we can see, however, is the duration of the call. If the call duration is less than 30 seconds, if it takes just 30 seconds for someone to introduce themselves, explain the problem, and have it resolved, it's probably an unnecessary call. So looking at all of those calls, um, we found an interesting um, correlation. At five seconds, on the x-axis, you see the ring time. At five seconds, the proportion of unnecessary calls drops from about, it's been a while since I've seen this, drops from 40% uh, to 10%, which is a considerable reduction. And the hypothesis is that actually, if someone's kept ringing for five seconds rather than have your phone picked up immediately, it gives them the opportunity to think, actually, it's not really one for the police, is it? And puts it down. So could it be that with that period of time standardized, you could actually free up more time for the operators to deal with um, calls that should come through? Quite a controversial one, I know, but it's an interesting finding nonetheless. I'm going to pass over to my colleague. Um, okay, perfect. So, the fourth example, encouraging people to attend court. Um, getting witnesses and victims to attend court is important. If they don't come, you get a cracked trial. It doesn't go ahead. The CPS, the defense, uh, and some of the other witnesses maybe might be there ready to give evidence, and the trial doesn't go ahead on the day. And actually, quite often that means that justice then isn't done, and perhaps the case is abandoned entirely. So, getting people to attend is important. Still working with West Midlands Police, we did some work with them looking at how could you encourage witnesses and victims to come to court. At the time, about 15% uh, of witnesses and victims didn't turn up on the day of trial. And we looked to see how we could improve that. Um, when we spoke to witnesses and victims about why they didn't come, come to court, there were kind of a number of reasons. Um, so, for instance, um, they might, there might be logistical factors. They couldn't book the time off work, uh, or maybe it was difficult to arrange childcare on the day, or maybe they were just on a holiday. There were other reasons, like genuine fear of repri reprisal from the defendant. Um, 
But we thought maybe on the logistical side, the kind of the side where they just uh, hadn't planned when they were going to turn up, maybe they'd just forgotten about it simply, that maybe there was something that behavioral insights could do uh, to improve that. So what we did was we took the approach that West Midlands was using at the time, uh, which involved, it started with a phone call, so they would call, they'd attempt to call to warn the witness and tell them that the defendant had pleaded not guilty and therefore uh, the case was going to trial. Um, and then after that call, whether or not they got through, they would then send a warning letter to that witness or victim, uh, telling them the court date uh, and some other details they needed to know. And finally, um, this was, it wasn't consistent, but sometimes some witness care officers at the West Midlands Police's witness care unit would also call the witness or victim um, a couple of days before uh, the case was going to come to trial to remind them to come, but that wasn't consistent. So what we did was we looked at those three stages of the process and looked at how we could improve them uh, using behavioral insights. So the first thing we did was we looked at the call itself and we gave the witness, witness care officers a new call script, which you can see up here. I've highlighted just a couple of kind of excerpts from it. The first one is around, uh, rather than witness care officers, uh, if the witness or victim said that they weren't sure they wanted to come to court or they were scared of coming to give evidence, it happened to be that sometimes the witness care officers would jump to saying, if you don't come to court, the court is going to summons you to come. And it became quite kind of legal and quite scary quite quickly. And instead we thought maybe you could use something a little bit softer. So you can see up here, uh, this social norms message, so we know it can be daunting attending court, but around 700 people each month give evidence at magistrates' courts in the West Midlands, which is true, and talking about the kind of support that they could arrange uh, to uh, support those witnesses and victims to come to give evidence. And so this is, you know, using social norms is based on the insight that um, we're very kind of social animals. If we know lots of other people are doing something, we want to do that too. So we're hoping that this would encourage people to come to court to give evidence. And then this, the next one was trying to use something that's called implementation intentions. So implementation intentions has been used to encourage people and help them to achieve goals, uh, from goals ranging from kind of eating more healthily, exercising more, helping disadvantaged students to um, attend and attain better at school. Um, and the idea is that if you want someone to achieve a goal, get them to plan exactly and specify exactly what, when, how, and like, where they're going to do it. So in this case, you can see here um, that we've asked them to think about what they actually have to do on the day. So take a moment to fetch your calendar and write that time down, but also have a look now. Is there anything you're going to be doing that day that you'd need to rearrange and make that plan at this stage? So that was the revised call script. And then secondly, we also looked at the warning letter that was sent to uh, witnesses and victims. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a double-sided letter you can see here. Um, and following on from uh, Simon's lesson around primacy and recency effects, so if you want someone to do something, put what you want them to do at the top of the message. We have, thank you for confirming you will come to Solihull Magistrates Court on 10th of September. And then in addition to help that planning process a little bit more, you can see in the right-hand letter that we included a checklist. So mark, insert the date of the court hearing in your diary, book the time off work, arrange childcare if required, um, and you can do a pre-trial visit uh, with uh, some of the people who help you to look around the court. And in addition, think about planning your journey. And we actually included a map for each of the courts uh, in the surrounding area and the local transport links to help make that easier. And then finally, we sent witnesses and victims a text message uh, seven days before they were due to uh, appear to come and give evidence. Um, and so you can see this one here. Hi, Simon. You're due to uh, attend Solihull Magistrates Court on 10th September at 9.30 a.m. The witness service will be expecting you 30 minutes before to give you time to prepare. I'm here to help, so call me on, and so on. So that was our new approach. Uh, and here are the results. So what we did was we randomly allocated our witness care officers, of which there were 36 at the time, uh, in the West Midlands Witness Care Unit, uh, to be either in the treatment or control group. So some of them were trained to use a new approach, and the rest of them used the business as usual approach. Uh, and they, between them, had about 2,500 uh, witnesses uh, and victims who needed to come to court in this period. Um, and this is what we see. So in the control group, about like nearly 85, about 82% of the witnesses and victims attended at least one hearing. 
Um, it's important to say one hearing rather than all hearings here because we, we were slightly concerned that um, if someone attended their first hearing and that was, say, adjourned, that they actually, that might then make them much less likely to attend the next set of hearings um, and that might kind of confound our results. So this is just at least one hearing. And then the treatment group, it's slightly higher. You can see it's 84%, so we make about a two percentage point increase, but these differences are not statistically significant. So while this is a kind of, this is a, it's directionally positive, we can't differentiate this result from chance. Um, the other thing is just looking at the subgroups is quite interesting here. So you can see that attendance in the control group for DV witnesses and victims, so witnesses and victims in domestic violence cases, is quite a lot lower, around 75%. And you can see that the treatment here, it, the, the kind of the difference between the treatment and control is slightly bigger than overall. And it seems that a lot of the success of the directionally positive results is actually mediated through the DV cases rather than the general cases, which we think is really, really encouraging. But again, these differences are not statistically significant. So this could just be chance. So that's something that is kind of positive. We're enthusiastic about it, but we don't have kind of solid results. But here's something else that we've been working on. Um, this is an um, uh, apprehended, apprehended domestic violence offender order, uh, which is something they have in New South Wales in Australia. Um, and essentially what, what they are is that um, police or victims uh, can apply to the court for this order to protect someone from domestic violence. Um, and actually, the problem with these orders is that about one in five of them in New South Wales, which is 7,700 a year, are actually breached. So the breach level is very high, um, and that has kind of knock-on effects for both policing resources and also stress for the victim. Um, and so what we did was we looked at whether we could improve this uh, ADVO, um, particularly if you do a flesh Kincaid test of the ADVO, which is a reading, reading age test, uh, it comes to about 13.5 years, which is quite high. So we actually hypothesize that some of the reasons that people breach these orders is they simply don't understand what it is they're meant to be doing. Um, so what you can see we did, is, which I've highlighted in red, is we uh, actually just changed this to be more kind of perpetrator-focused. We used the perpetrator's first name and addressed them as you rather than constantly saying the defendant all the way through. And in addition, we gave practical examples of what... Um, the kind, what the order itself meant. What were people meant to do in practice? So you can see here it says, you must not do or say anything that may make Jane Smith feel frightened or feel that you may harm her or damage her belongings in any way, including any jointly owned property and pets. So for each of the um, kind of clauses within the order, we gave these practical examples of what people were meant to do. Um, so unfortunately, before we managed to evaluate this, New South Wales rolled it out to everybody. Um, but uh, we did manage to evaluate whether you could uh, encourage um, the domestic violence offenders to come to court. Uh, part of the reason they need to come to court is if they dispute the ADVO, uh, they're required to come to court, um, and there's an interim order is given by the magistrate in the meantime, um, and they have a couple of court appearances they need to do. And in addition, coming to court might help them to understand the ADVO because it might be explained by the magistrate when they're there. So similar, similar to the trial we did with West Midlands Police, you can see um, we sent a text message to uh, the domestic violence offenders saying, Gary, this is a reminder that you have to attend Mount Druitt local court by 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. You must fo also follow the orders of your ADVO, etc." And then here are the results. So of the ADVO recipients who did not, so this is the other way around the previous graph, attend court on their court date, you can see that in the control group, we've got about 17.6%. And in the treatment group, we've got about 13.5%. So that's about a 20% reduction um, just by sending this text message to encourage people to attend court. Um, and we're currently doing things similar also with the Met Police, looking at um, encouraging wanted defenders to come to court uh, so that police officers don't have to go around and look for them. Um, OK, so second example, reducing reoffending. This was actually, this is also part of our program of work with West Midlands Police. Um, and actually, it was a slightly strange situation for us, because usually someone says, comes to us and says, we've got a problem with witnesses and victims not uh, coming to attend court. What can we do about it? And then we have to look for what is the vehicle we can use for our intervention. So we need to look for the kind of points of intervention, those touch points. Here we had a slightly different uh, situation where West Mids came and said to us, we have three custody suites that are going to be closed down in three months. Um, what do you think you could do with them in the remaining three months we have? Uh, in the fact that usually it's quite hard to make kind of uh, long-term changes like this one to a custody suite because actually painting a custody suite and refurbishing it, et cetera, is very difficult to do. So they said, 
you know, you've got three months before we decommission these suites, what would you like to do? Um, and so we thought perhaps um, it would be interesting to look at reoffending. Uh, at the time, about 25% of people who were either cautioned or got a custodial sentence or a non-custodial sentence went on to commit another offence within a year. And of course, you all know that the figures for uh, people leaving prison are much higher than that. Um, and so we thought it might be interesting to look at reoffending. Um, and particularly, we thought this was quite it's quite an interesting time in, when you're spending time in a police custody suite because when people are held there, they're there for 24 hours and quite a lot of the time they have fairly little to do. I know you come out for interviews and so on, but actually a lot of the time there's fairly little entertainment. Um, and so we thought this might be um, a bit of a captive audience for want of a better term. Um, and so uh, what we did was we create, created an intervention with three different parts. Um, the first was this wall message, which I'll maybe give you a second to read if you'd like. Um, okay, so if you've all had enough time, um, this message we wrote um, in collaboration with an ex-offender who actually managed to turn his life around, um, and it's kind of, it's based on his story, these are his words, um, but we've tried to incorporate some behavioral concepts. So you can see the first line, people think what they do makes them who they are, it doesn't. What we're trying to do here is reduce people's cr criminal, uh, sorry, criminal identity. We know that when you look at what works to reduce reoffending, people who have a, very, have a very strong criminal identity are much more likely to go on to reoffend. Um, and so we thought here we could try and reduce that. We also looked at trying to reduce, you may have heard of the concept of growth mindset versus fixed mindset. This idea that so, some people believe their talents are inherent and fixed, and some people believe that if they try hard and practice at something, they can actually go on and do that. And so what we're trying to do here is try and encourage a growth mindset and reduce a fixed mindset. So you can see it says, thought it was just meant to be that way, couldn't change. But the thing is, we do stuff for lots of reasons, and so on. And then finally, at the end, um, we tried again to use this concept of implementation intentions, trying to encourage people to plan for how they will change their behavior. And so you can see we say, um, if I've got one piece of advice, it's that the first step is the hardest, so make it small. Think, what's the one thing you can do to make sure you don't end up back here? Um, so th we had this message on the cell wall. There was a, an accompanying letter also from the ex-offender. And in addition, we wanted, if people did want to take that step and change, we wanted to make that as easy as possible. Um, so we included a support leaflet from West Midlands Police, which uh, kind of, it was the standard leaflet they had anyway, but directed you towards various types of support. So for instance, drug or financial worries, etc. cetera. Um, and so then what we did was we looked at whether or not uh, people were rearrested within the following five months. And obviously, rearrest is not an exact proxy for offending, so we need to just be careful about that. But this is what we see. So we had 32,000 people went through the custody suites during our period. About 16.7% of those went on to be rearrested within the next five months. And about 16.5% of them in the treatment group went on to be rearrested. But again, this, again, while directionally positive, it's a very small effect, and this is not st statistically significant from chance. However, we still think it's kind of an interesting touch point, an interesting point to intervene. So what we're doing currently is we're working with the Met to see what we could do tri trialing this same touch point, but using a different kind of message. <coughs> Specifically, what we're doing is looking at a message around being put onto the DNA database. So you can see this graph. This is from a study um, where they looked at the effect of massively increasing the DNA database in Denmark. So it used to be that about 4% of people who were arrested in Denmark would be, their details would be taken onto the DNA database. And then around this time, so I think it's April 2005, it increased to about 40%. And you can see here that the difference before and after people were taken on to the DNA database, there's a massive difference here in recidivism. Um, and indeed, they find in the study that the effect of being put on the DNA database has about a 43% deterrence effect on whether people go on to commit another offence within a year. And we think that maybe this, uh, this kind of message isn't coming across strongly enough when people are being taken into custody. Their DNA is taken, but perhaps the point that actually 63% of crime scenes can be linked to someone through their DNA is not 
uh, is not kind of emphasized enough. So our plan is to put a poster just like this saying we've got your DNA uh, in some custody suites uh, in the next couple of months um, and seeing whether, again, that has an effect on recidivism in line with this graph that we've just seen here. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we're coming back with the results of that soon. Okay. The final example. Um, so reducing susceptibility to phishing attacks. Phishing attacks matter. Um, I don't know whether anyone has seen this. This is the John Podesta uh, email hack. John Podesta was the uh, chairman of Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Uh, you can see he got this convincing email. Hi, John. Someone just used your password to try sign into your Google account, johnpodesta at gmail.com, and give some details, and then says, Google, stop this sign-in attempt. You should change your password immediately, and then has a link to say, change password. Um, and actually, people thought this email was a bit fishy at Hillary Clinton's campaign. So John's uh, private secretary forwarded this on to the IT guy, who unfortunately re responded this. This is a classic problem of leaving the IL off the beginning of the word legitimate and saying legitimate rather than illegitimate, which is what he meant to say. He didn't mean for John, he meant to say, this is a very dangerous email, do not click the link. And what happened in fact was because he said this is a legitimate email, John Podesta went back and clicked the link in the original email, you can see it there, changed password, clicked the email, changed his password, gave out his password to uh, the hackers, and thus the whole presidential campaign changed, and here we are. Um, so, phishing matters. And you're, you're probably familiar with, you will have seen the WannaCry attack and the effects on the NHS, you will have seen the UK, Ukraine uh, power grid outage, the Sony Pictures hack, so on. So anyway, we think this is important. Um, however, it's quite difficult to know how to change people's behavior when it comes to phishing. Um, we were working with the Mets Falcon team, and uh, they have their own materials trying to encourage the public, uh, to, like help them to reduce their susceptibility to phishing. Indeed, there's lots of other central government campaigns, so there's the Cyber Aware Scheme, there's the Cyber Central Scheme, and there's lots of messaging out there. But actually, when we looked at the evidence, we find that the number of what we would consider empirically robust studies testing this is actually fairly small. So you see studies which are basing their findings in a sample size of 40 people, um, which we wouldn't consider to be a robust size sample. So what we did was, we, um, with Falcon, we then partnered with a large organization and trialed three different types of training uh, to try and reduce people in this organization's susceptibility to phishing emails. The first one was based on this. This is the Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure's Don't Take the Bait campaign. Uh, so CPNI inside MI5, and they have this campaign um, and their campaign focuses on things like this. So you can see it talks about the tactics that fraudsters and fishers employ to try and, uh, try and trick people. So urgency, things like update your IT login now or lose access, or curiosity, your new payslip is available from HR, um, or there's a delivery in your name, etc. These are the tactics they use. So that was one of the forms of training. Um, this was just sent out via email to people. Um, it's worth noting that um, we didn't have, working with this organization, the resources uh, to do in-person training, which we actually think might be quite effective, but that's a kind of another thing for us to go on and test later, hopefully. So that was the first one. The second thing we tested was an email we created, so it had these kind of five rules of thumb that you can do to try and reduce your susceptibility to phishing. So, for instance, the second one, check the sender. Rather than looking at the, just the display name, click on the display name and see what you have in the brackets. Um, so, for instance, you, might, you can have any display name. So, I could have, you know, evapsa.com, um, and it would look like it was me when my actual email is from bi.team. So, that was one, one of the messages. Another is hovering over the link. Is that link really taking you to hsbc.com when it pretends it is? Um, and then, finally, report it. This is something that is really kind of, it is so important that people go on to report phishing emails, even if they think they've done the wrong thing, i.e. they've clicked their link or they've given out their details, because that's how you avoid a major breach kind of continuing for a long time and no one realizing. Um, so we were emphasizing reporting as well in our kind of five rules of thumb. And then finally, we did a form of training which is called embedded training, which is extremely popular in the private sector, although there are some worries in academia about whether this reduces trust in organizations. But we wanted to see whether it was really much more effective. The idea here is you kind of draw on the concept of a teachable moment. So you send out a mock phishing email. This is the one we used, which is something around an order being created on your account. Um, and then you see uh, if people do then uh, uh, kind of use, engage with that mock phishing email. So here we had a link. Uh, 
and you can see here that about 45% of people clicked our link, and then about 40% of those people went on to submit data. If you do on this page, um, which didn't look like this because it was with a large organization, but uh, it looks something like this. Um, and if you did then submit your uh, login credentials, you then saw a similar set of training to the people who got the BI email. So the idea is it's a teachable moment because a lot of people think that they are kind of immune to phishing emails. They think uh, they're very sensible and it's only little, little old ladies who fall for this kind of thing. And so this is showing maybe you are actually susceptible to this and then showing some top uh, kind of tips for how you can avoid falling victim in the future. So those are the three, three different arms. We have the two emails, the CPNI one and the one we wrote, and then we have the embedded training. And then what we did was we sought to test it. Uh, so we took, this is an email that uh, was really sent to the University of Berkeley at California. Um, they have this thing called the fish tank, which is great, which gives you lots of examples of emails they've been sent. And you can see it says, dear user, someone was trying to use your Berkeley ID to sign into iCloud via a web browser. Give some details. And then if, and then if you've not recently and believe someone may be trying to access your account, you should click here, etc. So we created an email very similar to this. Uh, and we sent it to uh, the people in our sample, which was about 17,000 people. And then they were taken through to a landing page, sim very similar to this one. Um, and then if they entered their details, we said, you know, thank you for confirming that your account has, has not been accessed at this time. Um, and the idea was, did we see any difference in the number of people who entered their login credentials based on whether or not they had been trained? Oh, and this is one other little thing you can see here. Um, we've changed this slightly, obviously, but you can see here we actually almost got caught doing this. Um, someone actually inspected uh, our uh, domain name for this landing page that we had uh, and found out that it was us uh, and uh, found out our address and stuff, which made us feel a little bit worried. And I didn't tell the IT manager in case we got blocked entirely. But anyway, so this happened to us. Uh, but anyway, the results. So we had about 17,000 people randomly allocated to one of four groups. Some of them received nothing, the control group. Uh, and about 8% of them uh, submitted their login credentials. Uh, and then we had some, we had some who had been trained using a CPNI training. And about 5.8% of them submitted their login credentials. BI was slightly less good, about 6.3. And then the embedded training was the most effective at 5.6. So I guess in terms of like relative reduction, this is quite high. It's about 30% reduction for the embedded training. Um, but it's actually, it doesn't eliminate the problem entirely. And I guess in terms of our actual sample, if everyone, had, uh, if everyone had been in the control group versus everyone being in the embedded training group, it would have resulted in about 400 fewer staff entering their full login credentials. Um, so that was, that was pretty exciting, but that was only three weeks after they'd been trained. So we were figuring out that these emails were probably still uh, fairly high up in people's head. Um, then what we did was we waited three months. So we waited 13 weeks after training. Uh, to see whether or not um, this training was effective in the longer term. Um, and what we did for this one was we sent a phishing email that was based, it was actually based on GDPR, because uh, we thought it was fairly topical. We did this fairly recently. Um, and we thought people might engage with it. Um, and you can see here, this is, this is what we based it on. This was a phishing email that was going around pretending to be from Airbnb. And you can see on the right-hand side, it says, uh, Airbnb has updated his, weirdly his, privacy policy for European users on 18th of April 2018. This update is mandatory because of the new changes in the EU digital uh, privacy legislation that acts upon blah, blah, blah. So that was the email we sent. We sent them a mock phishing email like this to all 17,000 users. Um, and then again, we took them through to a login page like this um, and asked them to accept the new privacy policy in light of GDPR and give us their login credentials. Um, and this is what we found after three months. So, oh, I can just hear myself a bit there. So in the control group, um, about 18.4% of people gave us their full login credentials. So our GDPR email was uh, very persuasive. Um, and then about 15.3% in the CPNI group, 16.4% in the BI, and 14.5% in the embedded. So again, we find like the results are fairly high here, but we do find that um, in terms of relative reductions, that this is still effective, um, even three months after training, which is actually quite surprising, to be honest. Um, I think we thought that you'd see something after three weeks, but possibly not after three months. But, and um, in terms of what that means in actual numbers, if everyone had been trained using embedded training, about 679 fewer staff would have entered their full login credentials. But I think the message here is that training is effective, but only a bit. This, we don't think you can fully eliminate the risk using training alone. 
Um, and so we do think you need to, A, maybe trial different types of training, but also think about what are the technical controls you have in place to reduce people's vulnerability to phishing. So emails like this just don't get into people's inbox in the first place. OK, that's it, I think. Any questions? Thank you both very much. I found it really interesting. I've got a question off the top of my head. I know there's a couple coming through on the app, but would encourage everybody in the room to ask away. Um, my question was, can people get wise to this kind of um, nudge theory? I mean, I know that I've been sent... Initially, I was sent a few emails, you know, which used my first name, and I thought, oh, it's someone I know. I'll act on that. And then I, now I just ignore them, just like I always used to. So is that a problem? So... The surprising evidence is that um, actually this, the effects are quite sustained. Um, Cass Sunstein wrote a paper about this where he, uh, he not only, I mean, he actually told people they were being nudged and, and the nudges were still effective. But, I mean, no doubt, depending on the intervention, um, people will get used to this kind of stuff. I remember a tax trial that we did about five or six years ago where we um, convinced HMRC to employ someone to handwrite on the outside of envelopes to really draw attention to, you know, oh, that's surprising, someone's written me a personal message on the outside. But if all letters did that all the time, <laughs> you can imagine that um, the effects would attenuate. So I think it probably depends on the intervention. But to be honest, you know, the main message here is small details matter, but also, you know, test stuff again and again and again. So, so long as you're iterating, you should be able to adapt. There's a good question on the app here um, about you've presented some examples where behavioural insights made an impact, but you've also mentioned some where examples, uh, some examples where it hasn't worked. What are those examples and why did they not work? I mean, you were quite honest about the different effects of what you've tested, but have there been some real flops that you can tell us what didn't work? Maybe Evie, you start with that. Um, yeah, one of the things we didn't actually include today, but we were thinking of including, was. Um, a trial we did, so we have an a office in New York and we're doing some work there also with police looking at diversity and recruitment. Um, and we did do a trial in one uh, US city um, where we sent postcards out to registered voters, um, which included a picture of a police officer and encouraged them, uh, said, are you up for the challenge? Join Police Force X now. Um, and we actually found that in, quite surprisingly, um, so overall it had a positive impact, it increased the number of people who applied to join the police. But when we broke it down into subgroups of men, male and female registered voters, we actually found that um, in one, and admittedly this is small numbers, so you'd want to test whether this effect happened again, um, but in one group which was male voters aged between 18 and 24, um, specifically male ones receiving a picture of a male police officer, it's st the treatment stopped people applying entirely. So people applied in the control group, and the treatment stopped people applying. It had the opposite effect for women. It tripled the number of women who went on to apply to the police. Women with a picture of a male police officer? Yeah, women with a picture of a male police officer. What so, about if you did a female police officer? So female police officer, again, was less effective for the women. Um, but I think, I think what's, what's difficult here is with an RCT that you don't know exactly why something does work or doesn't work. You just know it does or doesn't, basically. Um, we hypothesise potentially that um, in terms of the males who then it actually reduced applications to zero, that perhaps it was because um, they, they, these people were from low-income um, kind of uh, in areas with a high proportion of people from ethnic minorities, and perhaps they already saw joining the police as a challenge. So when you send them a postcard saying, are you up for the challenge, they think, well, I already think it's a challenge. You're kind of making that worse. You're encouraging that sense that people maybe feel like it's going to be difficult. Right, I'm going to come over this side so I can see the room in, in its entirety. I've got some quite good uh, questions on the app. A question here at the front, though. It's nice to get questions in the room as well so you don't all fall asleep. There is a roving mic, I think. Uh, yep, just here. If you could say who you are and where you're from, that'd be great. Hi, Ian Wiley, Avon Somerset. Good to see you, Simon. Um, in terms of the example you used for Avon Somerset and your point around, Cathy, around sustained change, uh, we continue to use those uh, uh, interventions within the application process and it has seen a sustained improvement in the number of ethnic minorities applying to Avon and Somerset. So uh, in terms of endorsing your approach, uh, it's very positive. I sound like a plant. <laughs> I'm myself. <laughs> and there was another question here, I think. Uh, don't we just, just here? Have I press ganged you into it? I'm good at that. 
Hello, I'm Richard Liss from uh, Thames Valley. We've been doing quite a lot of work on this with uh, Ogilvy Mather and uh, Rory Sutherland, actually. Uh, but just one of my questions is, I mean, th there's some really good examples, but they are quite discrete individual initiatives. Uh, do you think there's an opportunity for this to sort of be more transformational within the police? You know, and how would, how would you think we could roll this out so it would have an impact, as opposed to just on fairly discrete areas of policing, it could really impact upon the whole organisation? Or do you think that might be a bridge too far at the present moment? Um, so I think, I think the, the behavioural insights team resisted the t term nudge unit because nudge is quite a sort of restrictive term. And what we've presented are all nudges. I think there's a wider application of behavioural science which is encompassed in the term behavioural insights. Um, but the first point about nudges, nudges are, are about, I guess, accepting that people have biases um, and accommodating for them. So, you know drawing attention to social norms, for example. And in order for those to be successful, I think the most important thing isn't the, you know, the creativity of the intervention, it's working out what specific behavior you want to target the overall outcome. Um, in terms of like a broader transformational approach, it's harder to identify what are the kind of specific behaviors or suite of behaviors that, that you'd want to target. You might suggest something like, you know, motivation or, um, you know, as, as Evie referred to before from um, the kind of offender or end user's point of view, reduced identity as a criminal. Um, problem is that's much harder to measure. The, the, um, the trial that we uh, attempted on, on the cell wall, like, you know, that's a kind of um, kitchen sink approach to uh, an, a, an, a, an objective which is quite complicated, reoffending, and it's done with quite low investment, just a little bit of writing on a wall. But if you really wanted to like, you know, have a go at what you're suggesting, I guess the challenge would be, what are all the touch points? How can we infuse these sort of learnings throughout the whole of the, um, you know, the ability of a force or even broader than that to kind of affect that, that change? It would be wonderful if someone was up for that. But I, I mean, our assumption is that we might get there at some point if we build up sufficient evidence that this kind of approach works. But what I'm trying to say is all of these are quite low investment, so that's why they're, they're targeting quite specific behaviors. How many forces have you worked with, just as a, a follow up? I was trying to work it out just on the way up here, actually, but I think it's about 12. And why not more, do you think? Um, well, there's capacity issues. Also, um, I mean, there's only there's been a handful of occasions when um, a force has requested assistance and, and we've not been able to come to agreement. And that's usually been um, for financial resources or um, we're, we're, we have been quite um, dogmatic about wanting to test stuff in an empirical way. And sometimes smaller forces don't have the numbers that allow us to do that. Um, but uh, I'm certainly of the approach that, you know, if anything compromises, it's, it's the evaluation rather than the, um, than the objective. But um, no, I mean, we're a demand-led organization, I guess, so, so maybe there'll be more. Um, the question coming through on the app, which a lot of people have liked, uh, saying, have you assisted any forces on influencing internal behavior within the ranks from top down and examples of how that improved? Um, Evie, why don't you take this one? Okay. <laughs> I, don't think, I think he's going to tell an answer that I don't know, so right. I think Simon should do it. Um, we've done a little bit of that. Nothing that's been um, evaluated, so I don't have a kind of neat bar graph um, to show you. We've got, you know, there are a few things that we wanted to test, so um, we always thought it'd be quite neat. I know this would involve um, a technical change, so I don't know how feasible it would be, but we always thought it'd be quite neat if, um, with, a, with, a, with the body cameras, um, officers could note a point on the recording when they think they've done a good job, as well as you know being held accountable to stuff or, or whatever, um, so that you could do this and then submit it, and someone be, would be able to give feedback and, and congratulate or something like that. Um, and we think you know that kind of stuff might be um, a way of uh, improving morale internally. So more a positive endorsement than a sort of chastising. For sure. Okay, um, anyone else from, from the floor? Yeah, did I see a hand go, go up? No? Um, give me a wave if you want to speak because it's always good to get live questions. 
Great. Just here, Gavin. I've got plenty more on the app, but you're all a bit shy. Yeah, I'm going to follow my example first. Yeah. Question. I've got loads more I want to ask as well, don't you worry, um, Gavin? I was struck, Simon, by the number of countries now that are adopting this approach. How do we start to link in those various, you know, experiments and initiatives globally? Um, and how do you prioritise that? So what I'm thinking here is some of the issues which policing is facing in this country at the moment, particularly around violence, for instance, whether there are, uh, there's good practice taking place in other countries, which we're just simply not aware of, which we could perhaps adopt or start to think about adopting to look at you know, behavioural change um, around you know, street violence in the country at the moment. Um, jump in if you want. It's, it's surprising, isn't it, that there isn't like a, a bank of knowledge anywhere. There's a couple of organizations who, who compile stuff um, and learnings from other countries um, quite well. In terms of policing, I, I mean, I think the UK still has much more experience in behavioral science and policing than other countries. We've done a little bit in the States. But um, uh, we actually at one time were hoping the World Bank would be able to play a role in compiling um, learnings from across, because uh, they have their own, uh, own behavioral insights function, from across countries. Um, but as far as I'm aware, it's a challenge that still needs to be addressed. Very popular question on the app here, um, which is, I guess, a bit of a joke, but um, also actually I think could be answered seriously. How do we nudge government for more fair pay and conditions? Do you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I was thinking the equivalent of writing on the cell wall, you know? <laughs> put, put something on the helmets, perhaps? Yeah, actually, um, we've written a paper called Behavioural Government, which is um, a means of trying to help government's um, decision-making processes. Um, so maybe shove that under the uh, face of the Paymaster General. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we'll get plenty of chance to nudge the Home Secretary tomorrow. Just here, please. Hello, Jane Heim from Great Manchester Police. Um, I'm a district commander uh, in one of the districts in Manchester. It's a very busy, very busy area. And we suffer an awful lot of antisocial behaviour and knife crime amongst young people in particular. And I was wondering how this behavioural work could work in institutions such as schools, uh, particularly places, um, you know, where some of our more troubled uh, young people are based. Um, and if there's any work like that gone on, because I think it's such an important aspect for all of us in policing at the moment, trying to deal with our young people. Um, so we haven't uh, kind of, we haven't really done any work on knife crime and violence at the moment, but we're certainly interested in um, kind of the school context and what you could do there. We did a, we did a trial um, recently um, on something we call study supporter, which is asking uh, students who are in their GCSE years to nominate someone, um, say, not a direct family member, but say a friend or a family friend or a relative to support them in their studies. And the idea was that this study supporter was texted uh, kind of updates by the teacher. So that it would say, um, hi, Kathy. Uh, Simon has his trigonometry test this week. I uh, remember to ask him about Pythagoras' theorem or something. Anyway, we found that uh, really that increased uh, people getting uh, functional GCSEs by about 25%. So we're really pleased with that. But we did wonder, recently we've been doing some thinking about kind of knife crime and violence, and we wondered whether you could do something similar. When, when maybe people have come to the point where they're thinking, maybe they do want to leave a gang or change their lifestyle a bit, could we help those young people and support them through the process a bit better using some kind of similar um, program? Um, but yeah, that's just an idea. Another one from the app here. How can, you nudge, how can nudge theory encourage victims of domestic violence to provide statements? You sort of touched on the domestic violence area in your presentation. Yeah, I mean, it's quite an interesting question because um, one of the things we actually felt was difficult during our trial was that when, that we did with West Midlands, was that when the witness care officers called up the witnesses and victims and said, you're going to have to come to court to give evidence, a lot of them didn't realise that because, they, because they'd given a statement, it was pretty likely they were going to have to come to court. And we actually felt that that was a bit of a failing of the existing system. But you're right that if you then um, kind of say that very much up front, is it less likely that the people will then go on to give statements? Um, I think it's quite difficult, would be my sense, to encourage people to give statements, especially when they have genuine fear of reprisal. Um, 
I don't know. Do you have but, any... I mean, can you point out, for example, that they might be able to give evidence behind a screen or something like that? Is there something that you could do more up front and in clearer language on that? Yeah, certainly, and I think um, what the witness service does in the courts already, taking people there and getting them familiar with the court context and familiar with what it's going to be like giving evidence, I think that probably helps. Um, but it is, it is difficult when I think there are kind of the opposing side of that, um, the reasons people don't give evidence maybe or don't give a statement are sometimes reasonable. Right, I'm going to go over this side of the room because I feel like you, you've been let off the hook, so I'm going to have a little prowl. Um, there's plenty more on the app, but it would be great to get some questions in the hall if you could... Give us a wave. Great, thank you. At the back. Just here. I'm nudging you all fairly effectively, I feel. <laughs> I've learned from this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good nudge. Um, uh, Jason Tingley from Sussex Police. A lot of what you talked about and, and relates, I think, and links to culture. And with an internal focus, have you done anything around messaging for police officers and staff? And I'm thinking specifically of um, crime data integrity. So. We all know that a fundamental um, responsibility of policing is to record c crime properly. Every force in this room would have been, um, in, to some extent, inspected on that. And there's a lot of uh, around messaging, as opposed to, you will, some, some, uh, you know, some constructive messaging, anything you've done in regards to that. And I think that would be a real benefit to understand the consequences of not recording crime properly. Because, uh, as I said before, it's a fundamental requirement of us. Um, and we do go down that compliance route. It's something we must be doing. I mean, we've, we've not, but it sounds like a, a pretty good idea. One of the, I mean, your, your challenge about the specifics versus um, a kind of transformational approach is, is a fair one, but I do think there's you know, a lot of opportunity with specifics and um, nudges apply themselves quite effectively to processes. One of the things that we're doing currently with Avon and Somerset is looking at um, how, um, how decisions are made as to which uh, court offenders should go to um, and whether or not to keep offenders overnight and trying to um, sort of optimise those decisions. Um, but other than that, I don't think we're currently doing anything internally. Two final questions um, from the app. What is the greatest opportunity for nudge theory in policing? If you had to pick one area, what would you say? Um, should, I, should I go quickly? So this is just my kind of pet thing, really, but um, it comes from the, um, I, I brought it up with the, the legitimacy and speed limits. I think there's, there's something which, this is a general thing and probably applicable to a bunch of different areas, but the means in which authority, um, law enforcement in the broadest kind of um, definition of that, including borders and a bunch of, bunch of other areas, um, the, the way um, the end user is communicated with very much creates a sense of them and us, I think, and that doesn't aid compliance across the board. Um, and I think there's a means of creating legitimacy, creating trust, um, and, for example, reducing a sense of criminogenic identity if you're dealing with offenders that can um, be positive throughout the criminal justice system um, and have, you know, measurable immediate effects, but also probably longer-term effects as well, which would be positive. And I, I certainly echo that in when I get um, many police officers on the media, you suddenly sort of stop looking like human beings and you have this sort of language that you put on. Mm. So as, for me, that seems like a, just a personal observation. Mm. Just finally, where can people get the details around the projects you've spoken about today? Do you publish your findings? Is there somewhere people can get hold of the details? We try to publish everything um, that we can. So our website, just Google Behavioural Insights Team, um, there's a lag, obviously, because um, you know completing the project is the priority, and then finding the time to write it up comes comes second. There's also um, some discrepancy as to whether or not um, departments and forces that we work with want stuff to be published, because sometimes, you know, we do control and treatment, so the control sometimes is revealing of the status quo. Um, so I'm sure forces and other departments would be. Um, willing to, to share that information with other forces. Um, so, you know, you can always just drop me an email and ask if there's something been studied on a particular area. Um, so I'm happy to do that as well.